So um, I'm Kiri. That's Vitaly. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, we work for Oracle. Obligatory slide here. Another obligatory slide about you know Kubernetes, preaching to the choir here. Kubernetes growing. This is uh, from the survey from uh, the spring. Uh, production picking up. Uh, really bringing up the topic of multi-cluster more and more, as, especially as production workloads go, go in there. Um, take your pick. Probably one of these is one of the reasons why you're looking at multi-cluster as well. Uh, but generally, the trend is going there. Um, what happens when you do multi-cluster? Lots of challenges to look at. We try to look at a little bit uh, from a different angle, a little bit earlier up the decision stream, if you will, in terms of... Uh, how you arrive to proper multi-cluster strategy. So literally a um, stream of decisions that lead to certain um, you know, environments where you have to fulfill. But basically the type of questions that come in, usually it's, well, how many clusters do I run? What's the best practice there? Do I run cluster for every business unit, for every app, for every service, for environments, for all of these questions uh, usually come up when you start uh, looking at real live deployment of uh, Kubernetes uh, with multi-cluster, right? Um, then you get into, you know, how big the cluster should be, when do I resize them, how fast do I make those decisions, what type of tech do I use to manage the life cycle of those clusters, when is that decision made, what providers do I use, if you're, if you're running on public or even in private in terms of what type of tech stack you use, um, you know, how to guard myself against some of these decisions in the future, uh, to avoid potential, uh, you know, day two problems or whatever they, uh, you know, later down the, uh, uh, w you know, when uh, when you try to make some decisions later. Um, and finally, how do we deploy applications to those multi-clusters? How do we achieve higher availability of those applications, uh, some continuity and so forth? So a lot of these questions come up in the organization. So. We sat down at Oracle a few months ago and started to look into this. And we kind of started looking in terms of um, uh, how would we approach um, solving these problems both for Oracle and, and for the customers, for our customers as well. But before we get into what kind of what our thoughts are on this, generally what an organization would do is kind of implement some kind of process. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure this, it's a very generic way of representing, but normally it would be some kind of organizational solution to those questions with a lot of processes and tools out there. You'd usually start with some kind of decision and design to containerize an application to use Kubernetes. From there, you would meet and you do some kind of reviews about what's current, what's the latest, and you know those decisions then, you know, they're delegated to other teams like development and ops to be able to kind of execute upon those decisions. A lot of communication going back and forth. Ultimately, it ends up with some work being done by the operations team, usually to manage the clusters, development to deploy those clusters, picking their own solutions, getting some reports out of it, closing the loop, looping. Basically, you kind of end up organically growing into this. If you're good, maybe sometimes you look forward and you strategically implement some kind of process. But and there's vari variations of this stuff, obviously, depending on on your organization and the roles, whether you do DevOps or not. So there's uh, there's quite a bit of uh, um, decisions going on here, and one of the key points we're doing here is, is people usually make a lot of these decisions ahead of time. Before you even get to deploying clusters, you're already deep into a bunch of decisions being made. Um, usually as you go, you kind of end up um, <coughs> requiring people with certain skills. The better people you have, the better you're going to do this. Some companies do it better, some, some do it worse. But in general, what we looked at it, it's, it's, it's really a process organization people type of solution to those questions that we posed at the beginning, right? Um, we kind of started looking at, well, you know, the proverbial, there must be a better way, right? So we kind of decided to take a blank look. Obviously, no better way to indicate a blank look than a blank slide, I guess, but literally we wanted something that can use some tech, some software to be able to tackle some of those questions a little bit later. So. Given that we're committed to the Kubernetes ecosystem, whatever the first obviously thing you start looking at when you're talking multi-cluster is the Kubernetes Federation. How many of you are familiar with the Federation? All right, good. How many of you have tried a Federation? All right. Um, so a few hands. Uh, the Federation is there to 
do multi-cluster, we looked at it, and, and it's, um, if you start going through the documentation and the setup, you'll end up doing something like you install a control plane. It's, a, it's in its own control plane, basically runs separate from your clusters. Um, you start up a federation. Basically, normally what you would do is you would go through and add some clusters. They call it join, right? So generally, you would have to go and figure out how to create the clusters, and the federation just allows you to join those clusters in the federation. Once you have the clusters ready, what you do is you deploy to the federation control plane, which is pretty much the same process. You can use Coop control. It's very similar to deploying to a cluster, but you're deploying to this sort of virtual layer, which then you know, delivers the, the necessary application to the multiple cluster. That's kind of how you would end up at this point looking at multi-cluster, right? So if you look at this and you compare it to the type of questions that we posed in the beginning, well, it's kind of scratching the surface on some of them, but a lot of them are kind of left unanswered, if you will, right? So it may start giving you a little bit of uh, an option of how to deploy apps to clusters, but it, it does nowhere near in terms of making decisions about how many clusters should be out there, how what the size of the cluster should be, who is responsible for them. None of that stuff is really covered with the Federation. But it's a really good stepping stone. We looked at it, it's, it's a separate control plane. It's a very interesting piece of the puzzle. So what we started thinking about it as well, right now it's a little too late. We already built the clusters, right? If you wanted to tackle those problems, what we wanted to figure out, well, what if we remove the clusters? Has anybody tried this in the Federation? Deploying an app without having any clusters in it? No. What do you think is gonna happen? Right, so the Federation has its own etcd store, has its own sort of desired state and all of that stuff. So what's gonna happen is the application is gonna go in there and it's just not gonna be scheduled because there's not, it's akin to not having nodes in a, in a cluster, right? So you're gonna say, well, it's useless, but it's not useless. What you've just did, you've just captured the desired state, right? So we said that's a great starting point for us, right? We have a desired state. Now what we can do is we have an input that we can use programmatically to answer those questions. So if I have an actual deployment, I basically have a programmatic way to describe the demand from my developers, right? What I need to do is figure out how to add something that will derive the answers that I wanted. It's like if I know what they're trying to deploy, I may be able to figure out what clusters do I need, how big should they be, and all that stuff. So what we did is we created an additional component that sits next to the Federation, we're calling it Navarcos at this point, Navarcos being Greek for Admiral. So what Navarcos is, is a controller that sits within Federation control plane that specifically listens to your deployments and it will start making decisions about what clusters you need in the whole world, right? So what does that mean? And obviously, without going into too much details, we'll cover a little bit later about the details, but that's kind of the general direction change, if you will, right? What we did in addition to that, we added one extra component to be able to offload Novarcos for some of the low level sort of piping in terms of managing the cluster. So we created another component called Cluster Manager. So really what happens is Novarcos listens to the demand, makes decisions of what supply you need, and that supply then get, gets orchestrated by what we call the Cluster Manager. It's actually a pretty simple wrapper around things like COPS and we implemented a wrapper around uh, the Oracle Container Engine. So what it's doing is essentially acting as the human who used to sit doing the COPS command lines. Right now, the Navarcos emulates that human, basically. So what you end up with, the clusters get created and the application gets deployed. So, but what we really ended up with is having this control plane where we can use software to tackle a lot of those questions. And that's where we're at right now. So um, <laughs> we're gonna get into a little bit of the advantages of, of doing that, but um, um, what we really call this thing is an application-aware infrastructure. Ideally, it's all about the developers, right? So the, the app is the king here, right? Everything else should really be contextually based on the app. So at this point, um, what we're trying to do is essentially kind of open up that control plane to be able to very dynamically procure, adjust the infrastructure based on the application needs. We're gonna do a really quick demo. Vitaly's gonna do a demo here. We're gonna come back and talk a little bit more about the advantages. Um. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Um. <clears throat> okay, so 
demo. Here's what we're going to do. So as Kira already mentioned, um, Navarcos uh, runs uh, alongside with um, Kubernetes Federation. So here I already have uh, my um, Kubernetes cluster up and running with um, Federation pods provisioned. You can see there is a, um, a two pods uh, for Federation API server and uh, um, uh, Cuba controller manager. And uh, these are a couple pods for Navarcos, namely Navarcos and the cluster manager itself, and a little, a little helper pod there that uh, I, I will explain later on. <clears throat> so um, uh, now let's start with configuring our supplies. Um, right now I have Clean Federation, there is uh, nothing uh, configured there. And um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to um, load the cluster configurations objects into the federation. So uh, right now, um, Navarco supports two cloud providers. One is uh, Oracle Kubernetes Engine and uh, AWS, obviously. So. Um, Let's take a look on this uh, uh, cluster configuration YAML's definition. So uh, it basically the generic uh, federation cluster, uh, uh, although with some additional uh, config attributes that are required by the cloud provider. So the standard stuff like uh, uh, availability zones, uh, uh, working node shapes, uh, workers per availability zone, and, uh, and so forth. That's what it looked like for, for uh, Oracle, and these are for AWS, pretty much the same thing, just a little bit more specific uh, attributes AWS related with zones, public SSH keys, and whatnot. And, uh, and as you can see, all of those configurations are uh, put here as an uh, uh, um, annotations. So the key point here is to take a look at the lifecycle state of this configuration, which is offline. And um, um, so we're going to load these um, uh, configuration objects into, uh, into our federation. So again, I'm not joining any live clusters into the federation. I'm just configuring a placeholders that, uh, if demand will arise, will get provisioned and the cluster will become available for the federation to deploy to. So <clears throat> we created, uh, okay, so now we got three clusters loaded into the system and they're all in an offline state, uh, nothing's going on there. Um, <clears throat> so um, the next step would be to create a demand. Um, that uh, we're going to have to um, consume those, those, those resources. So this is a simple deployment. Uh, I configure the SAML to request 50 replicas. It's uh, the image on a public uh, Docker repo. It's a simple Node.js app that I just want to uh, uh, go ahead and, and uh, de deploy into my uh, clusters. So let's take a look at what's going on with our cloud provider. So obviously, this is a, Oracle Kubernetes Engine, nothing's running there, no clusters. On AWS, EC2, nothing's running, no instances. Uh, the same thing with um, uh, AWS uh, EC2 West, there's nothing there. So uh, um, let's go ahead and uh, uh, create this uh, deployment in Federation. Oh, uh, first, yeah, first I need to create namespace, and uh, uh, <clears throat> then I'm going to create uh, this dummy deployment within this namespace. All right, so uh, we can see the deployment is created with desired number of replicas as 50, uh, but nothing is currently running. But the has already detected that I've got a, um, a demand, and uh, going through my Available supplies, 
I see that I have three configuration items that I can uh, start provisioning, and as you could see already, the uh, Oracle cluster got uh, provisioning, EC2 instances got instantiated, and um, on the east and on the west coast, and the system will start bringing up the Kubernetes clusters. When they become available, <coughs> uh, the federation will start uh, reconciliation, and it will deploy this uh, simple app into all of those uh, clusters that at this point will be uh, in a live state and uh, available um, for the Federation to deploy. So, <clears throat> so uh, uh, again, as, as you can see, this is two different zones in a, in a public cloud provider, two different providers, and uh, the deployment will get uh, deployed to all, all three of them. So this is a little uh, dashboard that uh, we created on top of the federation. We have a little controller running alongside that streams the uh, federation events into the Elasticsearch, and this gives us a good uh, possibility to visualize what's going on with federation. So now, as you can see, the two clusters, uh, um, EC2 clusters already got provisioned, and uh, uh, Navarca's deployed um, 22, 25 pods in each one of them, and uh, the Oracle cluster just joined the federation, and as soon as the uh, system um, will uh, detect that it's uh, up, and, up and running, the, there is enough capacity there, it will, um, <coughs> it will uh, redistribute, redistribute the pods across all three of them evenly. So, system constantly monitoring the state of the clusters and the available capacity on those clusters. And based on this data, it actually schedule the uh, uh, application replicas uh, accordingly. So it's like uh, one level up uh, scheduling, the same thing the Kubernetes does across the worker nodes, the uh, Navarcos does on, on the cluster level. So, uh, as soon as it uh, will become available, let's see, it's uh, coming up. <coughs> and, uh, um, right. Okay, so it's, uh, now we, we, we have three clusters, and um, Arcos deployed this uh, application, uh, even like 17 uh, pods in, uh, yeah, like, 17 East 2, 17 in Oracle, and 17 in West 2. So that's, that's what we call the, uh, just in time, the Kubernetes cluster. And again, if I, if I, if I drop down and I delete this, uh, this deployment and I uh, release resources, all of those clusters will get shut down, and then they will wait until the next demand will come in place. All right, so uh, that's, I'll yeah. hand it over back to Kira. So, um, we do have actually one more shorter demo later. We're going to try to show a bursting use case if we get enough time. But I wanted to cover really uh, conceptually, so what does this mean? Like, I mean, that was kind of an explanation of how it works, but I want to go back and sort of start exploring uh, really the benefits or the advantages of taking this type of approach. Um, so one of the reasons we actually did it originally with the Federation is to provide some consistency on the clusters. We realized that if you don't have control over who's building the clusters, you really don't have much control over, I mean, does it run Ingress or not? Does it run, what type of networking does it? It gets really complicated from a Federation perspective. It's like herding cats at that point, right? So for our solution was, well, in order for, for us to run a successful multi-cluster deployment, whatever, we have to get gain more control over the capabilities of those clusters. and. Obviously, since we're provisioning the clusters, we can ensure that they have the right or similar capabilities. One way to do it is to kind of wait for conformance and all of that stuff, but since we have control, we can, the consistency is key there. You can run the same, or the, your right kind of ingress, your right kind of add-ons, the right kind of CNI, or whatever it is, you have full control over that, so that it's, you know, it, it, it matches what you really need to do for your applications, right? Uh, manageability. If, if you notice, one thing happens is once you start treating the clusters, you're essentially going from treating the clusters as pets to, to treating them as cattle. It becomes very ephemeral, right? 
And that, that actually creates a lot more manageability, in my opinion, because now you can start doing upgrades. You can move things much, much easier than before, where you kind of treated your clusters as, you know, <laughs> these are your little, uh, you know, uh, static assets that you wanted to, to use, right? Uh, obviously, portability of the application also follows because as you're moving clusters, you can move, start moving applications a little bit faster with this stuff so that it gives you more portability of your application. Cost is a huge thing, right? So um, because we're doing just-in-time cluster, we're essentially constantly optimizing the available well, allocated infrastructure that you pay for to match exactly what the current demand is. This is important in a public cloud, but you'll see that it, there's actually various type of use cases for, for cost and we'll cover and that, that actually do it in, on a private cloud as well. You can share much more of the infrastructure and provision clusters based on seasonality for some of your apps and kind of sharing the same underlying infrastructure in the private cloud, which ultimately will save you cost because you don't have to run as much infrastructure to achieve uh, the optimal um, uh, uh, workload sort of uh, consumption, right? Uh, Compliance, one of the things we realized that once we wedged that control plane in between the actual infrastructure and the new, so it's kind of like we put something in between dev and ops. And one of the huge things that you can take advantage of there is for things like governance and compliance. I mean, you can do significant amount of things in that layer before your applications hit the actual infrastructure, right? So if you start thinking about security compliance or, or even just budgets and things like that, and I'll cover some of the use cases later, but it, it, it can improve. There's tons of compliance use cases that can take advantage of, uh, of that um, pattern, if you will, right? Um, Multi-cloud managing, so one of the things, for example, auto-scaling. We've implemented scale up, scale down in that stuff, but we're doing it right into the federation control plane using abstract objects. What that gives you is the ability to scale up and down regardless of who your provider is, which gives you a lot more multi-cloud compatibility because all the business logic or operational logic that you're putting in the system, it's not really specific to, the, to any provider. Um, global scale, obviously, when you want to light up certain regions, certain continents, and all of that stuff, it should be fairly easy to just kind of extend because everything should really work. At that point, it's just a matter of declaring the right policy and the right uh, selection criteria there when you get to that from that central control player. And obviously, the ability to do private public a little bit easier. So a lot of these, like, you know, there is kind of like, it's almost like a platform at that point that you can keep working on and adding more... Um, use cases. So if you look at some example use cases that we can solve, obviously doing a continuous delivery of an application to multiple regions. And I know we didn't talk too much about how the application is actually configured in that multi-region. We've done a, um, a bit of a development on, you know, adding additional sort of federated ingress controllers and stuff. We'll cover that a little bit as well. But that's the, the sort of the primary use case to be able to deploy apps to multiple regions um, and kind of be able to kind of scale up and down anytime you want. Uh, bursting. And I don't mean necessarily bursting just in a classical single lab going from private to public. There's all sorts of interesting use cases that uh, we can do with bursting by prioritizing the cluster. For example, as I said, in a private cloud, you can have a set of dedicated infrastructure for certain business units and a set of shared infrastructure for anybody to burst on. So you should be able to run your base workload and only when you need, it's gonna burst to a set of clusters with a lower priority that are shared. That way you can more effectively share private infrastructure for multiple business units. Or on Amazon, if you wanna use spot instances versus dedicated instances, so you go on the reserve, they're there, but then you can burst on spot, for example. So, or, or the demo we're gonna do is potentially if the application allows, depending on latency and, and data affinity, you should be able to burst from private to public as well. So all of that stuff is an option because your control plane does allow you to do that sort of like baked in. Um, obviously, we talked about manageability, the ability to do you know Kubernetes cadence releases. Everybody's stuck with doing upgrades. Well, when the clusters are very ephemeral, you can inline upgrades. You can still do them probably, depending on what your underlying tech you use to, to be able to do, but major upgrades could become a problem. This allows you to simply junk a cluster, replace it with another cluster, without even telling anybody in development, basically. Um, continuous integration with sort of temporary clusters. You know, you deploy the app, the app deploys the cluster, you do an end-to-end -end test, you undeploy the app, it shuts down the cluster. That's a use case too. Um, and as I said, as, as we realize that we have this sort of um, uh, limbo control plane that sits in between, we can, we can start looking at, for example, service meshes. If you want to do inject 
uh, things on a global scale, you can use that control plane because you have visibility for the global, the sort of the global desired state, if you will. We can start using it for, for security, to insert network policies, to insert service mesh rules, and all of this stuff is, is possible. We've done some pilots. Um, these are kind of not in, uh, something we have implemented yet, but are possible use cases that we can take advantage of. Also managing budgets, you know, if you're using multiple providers, then you get stuck with, well, how much capacity do I give each team in each provider? This kind of allows you to potentially centrally control some of that stuff um, because it's, it, it governs the, the usage of, of the underlying infrastructure, right? Um, so I think Vitaly, you want to show them the, the bursting? Yeah, so uh, for this demo, I'm trying to simulate the use case when you have your private cloud with uh, cluster running in it, and you want to burst out into the public cloud. So I had a, a federation running locally on my laptop on Minikube, and I have another cluster uh, running again on my laptop on Minikube, and I joined this cluster to my federation to be a managed cluster, and I call this my little private cloud. And on top of that, I registered my burst out uh, cluster object. Uh, I configured it to be uh, used in Oracle Kubernetes engine. And usually, when everything's cool, I run locally. My uh, Oracle uh, cluster is offline. I don't touch it. So um, let's take a look at uh, how it works. So as I said, I have two clusters here. Burst out, OK, Oracle, Kubernetes Ascension is in offline. MQ1 is in ready state. And uh, um, let's take a look a little bit in more details um, uh, how, how, how these uh, clusters are defined. So as I said, this one is an Oracle one with a standard uh, provider uh, configuration. And then uh, 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 the, the key difference here is this, this new uh, uh, cluster priority attribute that is for Oracle is set to two. And uh, uh, <clears throat> for Minikube one, the priority is one. And this has a little, uh, this has limitation. The number of allocatable pods is set to 30. And the use pod is already 25 because I already deployed um, my uh, app here. <clears throat> And it's already used up some of the capacity. So uh, again, back to little dashboard here. We see that uh, pretty much 100% of this deployment is resides in uh, MQ1, which is my private cluster. And my burst out OK cluster is uh, offline. So um, what I'm going to do here now is um, um, I will look. Okay, the, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to demonstrate that uh, this, this deployment have desired replicas 20. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, scale it up to 40. And uh, let's see what the system is going to do in this case. So I'll do the cube cattle scale and put the replicas equal to 40. All right, so it's scaled now. <coughs> And we can see, yeah, that it's uh, um, uh, already set. Yeah, number of uh, desired uh, replicas is 40, and current is 20. But what happened, Navarcos already de detected it that uh, requested number of pods is over capacity of my private cloud. So it went ahead and started provisioning my burst out cluster in, in the Oracle cloud. Uh, so. As soon as will become available, what it's going to do is going to um, <clears throat> fill up all of the available capacity on my private cloud, and whatever remaining pods left is going to burst out into uh, my uh, 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 public cloud cluster. So we can see, like, okay, my uh, Oracle cluster is up and running, and if we go back here, you see the distribution. So the blue one is whatever the left uh, number of pods. Uh, got burst out into the public cloud, and it's used up all of the capacity on uh, on my uh, Minikube. 
So uh, now the most important part of all of this versatile stuff is, is shrinking back and how the, the resources will get released while you know, your peak time is over already. So um, <clears throat> again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just scale my deployment from 40 replicas back to 20. And uh, um, let's see how the system is going to react to that. All right, so it's scaled. Um, <clears throat> if you go back here, you see now all the uh, 20 replicas are back on uh, my mini cube, and on my burst out cluster, I have uh, zero uh, process, zero pods running. Now the system again monitors that okay, my burst out cluster become idle, so pretty much no user pods running there, and within a idle TTL time, if, if nothing's going on there, it will pretty much shut it down because we don't need it anymore. And uh, uh, that's basically what we're going to see here. Uh, I should, okay, yeah. So uh, as, as you can see, this cluster already being terminated because it's, it's idle and uh, we don't need these resources anymore. So that's, that's pretty much it on a uh, burst out uh, use case. How come he gets the applause all the time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because one more slide, we're done. We've got five yeah. minutes for questions. Um, we open sourced this stuff yesterday. Uh, currently, it's on the uh, Oracle GitHub account. Uh, there's actually the primary um, component there. Novarcos is there, the cluster manager supporting component. We also made some additional enhancements and changes. We have a federated ingress controller that uses DNS as a backend. This, is, this has to do with kind of managing the application a little better in multi-cluster. That was not focused today, but it's, we got some more code out there that we didn't cover today. We are going to work with uh, uh, the SIG multi-cluster to see what, uh, you know, if we can kind of make this an incubator project. We're just kind of starting those discussions right now, but that's, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Yeah, great question. So the, the question was like, you know, the underlying problem of, of applications running into multiple providers with stateful sets. Yes. So, and I kind of hinted a little bit on that. Obviously, the runtime needs to support that. Now, what I will tell you right now is, is that we're working on potentially doing a full stateful um, set uh, uh, global application. Now, the Federation has still hasn't released the stateful sets yet. So we're kind of trying to, we've done some uh, pilots where we can link up the clusters using Calico, where we run like uh, direct. So some of the applications that are stateful, especially if you're running your stateful set as a data application within Kubernetes, you'll be able to use the sharded application. So essentially it's going to start create, like let's say you're running Cassandra or Kafka or something like that, right? It's going to start sort of bringing its own data as replicas into the other providers to be able to, it's not supported right now, but it's, it's coming along. And obviously, as I pointed out, the bursting from private to public in a single application, it's a kind of complicated use case. But the, but the bursting, as I mentioned, it within the same cluster to be able to share some of the local infrastructure, either in a public or a private provider, it's a valid use case that you can take advantage of right now while we're waiting for sort of better support, you know, for stateful apps across a hybrid. But yes, I mean, that that's an underlying problem that you can solve with a control plane on top of it, right? You have to be able to, we can, what we want to do is enable compatibility if the application supports that, that your control plane will support that. But it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg, right? <laughs> so one thing, if your application supports it and you're still stuck with, well, how the heck am I gonna manage all this stuff, right? This gives you the opportunity to manage it once it's ready. I mean, it's not a perfect answer, but. Yeah, go ahead. That's correct. The federated control plane is, is it's got its own HCD. It uses the same API machinery re state reconciliation as the primary cluster. Right now, the way they distributed it, it actually kind of needs its own host cluster, but it's it's all completely up to you on how you run the federation. 
control plane itself with Navarcos. Now we've been doing a lot of work on trying to create highly available federated control plane because it's kind of becomes the critical point. So we're probably going to come up with some um, solutions soon that you look into it. But but yes, it's it's its own control plane at this point. And you know, obviously, I would expect that at some point, it, you know, either you can run that control plane on your own with some high availability tools or potentially, you know, rely on some providers or something to give you that control plane, but it's completely separate from the clusters, right? Well, I mean, it's, you can create that control plane on your own because it's, it just requires like a special host cluster. So you can deploy it as a regular Kubernetes app. Obviously, you have to manage the federated control plane yourself. Um, and it gets into a bigger discussion about, you know, well, how do I manage a highly available federation? So you get into discussion about using federation to manage federation and whatnot. Again, we, we have some ways to do it, to, to do it and we'll hopefully it'll come. But you can either choose to run your own federation control plane and you can choose whether you want it containerized or not and which providers you want to run the control plane, whether you want multiple provider redundancy for that control plane. But that, again, that has nothing to do with all the other runtime clusters that you use for your application. So it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's essentially a, um, uh, it's, it's control plane only, right? There's no worker nodes or anything in that control plane, right? All it's doing is storing desired state. It doesn't run anything on its own. It just controls the other clusters. So it's pretty lightweight from that aspect. Yeah. Uh, one more question? All right, go ahead. Yeah, so great question. Right now we're kind of, um, so yes, they're first class objects. We're currently borrowing the cluster spec definition that the Federation came up with, which is not really sort of a, a, a resource first class. Because it only describes the clusters that were pre-built, but we kind of flipped it. So we are using the cluster spec as a source to manage the clusters. There is a new working group right now is trying to declare cluster APIs and new specs about managing clusters and whatnot. But your second part of the question, if I understood it correctly, is that the complexity of kind of making some policy-based decision about which apps needs to run on what clusters, even if it has to build the clusters, yes. I mean, there's a feature in Federation called Cluster Selector that will give you some basic sort of segmentation, uh, but obviously the segmentation is not at this point limited to what's actually running. If the segmentation chooses to start using some clusters that are kind of idle or offline, it'll start bringing them up and whatever. So you do have some capabilities to start sort of like label-based selector type of decisions. So you can you can have a bunch of clusters that are labeled production or QA or west or east, or you can come up with whatever labels you want. You can have your developers bring their constraints, basically saying, I want an app, I want it to run in Europe, I want it to be secure, I want it to be whatever, but they're never picking clusters. All they're doing is they're giving you conditions that need to be satisfied. It's your responsibility when or whatever in, on the Navarcos side, that's kind of the whole point of this thing, really. It's to decouple that uh, developer flow, if you will, from the actual infrastructure in a way of, you know, you have a query and you need to satisfy that query. Yeah. All right. That's it. Thank you.